Well, finally, we're going to start looking at the text itself uh, that really made up the uh, song that Paul was singing or was sharing. I'm sure that when he said these words, they immediately came to Timothy's mind as something that they sang in worship in the church of Ephesus. Maybe that's where it was created. Maybe that's uh, why Paul knew it and Timothy knew it. But it was something to bring him into remembrance. And that's kind of the thrust of what Paul is moving towards as he's talking about enduring hardships is that part of enduring hardship is remembering the faithfulness of God. And what he told us in writing to the Ephesians and the Colossians is that singing is supposed to admonish us and to bring us back into a place of remembering, not just in our minds, but deep within our souls, within our hearts, that it's something that we know to be true and we know it because we feel it deep inside of us. And I think you can get that same uh, sensation just by reading the Word to some degree, because I think what happens many times when we're reading the Word and we begin to really meditate upon it, it begins to really sing to our souls, even though we might not have a melody associated with it. But it's amazing with people who have some kind of a musical uh, gift, that musical gene inside of them, there tends to be a, a, a translation of, of what God is saying to them in his word into things that they can express, which is exactly what we find when we read the book of Psalms. That's what David was doing. But Paul in verse 11 says to Timothy, here is a trustworthy saying. And I think it's important just to camp for a moment on this word trustworthy, because trustworthy means it's something that's honest and it's truthful. It, it, it's basically, we would say, timber that you can build with. It's a, a foundation that you can build upon. It's something that is secure and stable and you can rest your soul on it and not worry about being overwhelmed or sunk or buried alive. It's something that has a, a stick to itiveness about it. And he said, this is what's trust, trustworthy. And the trustworthy thing is, if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. You know, um, the, the disciple of the Apostle John, a man by the name of Polycarp, who himself was ultimately a martyr for the faith. He was probably in his 80s, maybe even his 90s, when he was burned at the stake. But... Uh, he chose that uh, over uh, being delivered from death. And as the, as the consul said to him, you can die in your own bed peacefully. He chose rather to burn to death because he said, all these years, uh, God, Christ has never failed me and I will not be unfaithful to him now. So basically, this great man of faith wrote a letter to the church in Philippi. It's called To the Philippians, uh, chapter 5, verse 2. And, and it gives us really almost a repetition of these very same words. He says, if we please Christ in the present world, we shall inherit the world to come. As he has promised to raise us from the dead, and as he has said, if we walk worthily of him, so shall we reign with him. So the wording is not exactly, of course, part of that may be the result of translation from one language into another, but the thought is literally the same as that which Paul has expressed in these two opening verses that we've read today in verse 11 and verse 12. And it's the idea that, that uh, as a Christian, I can trust God to keep his word to me. And that's something I think we struggle with because when, Paul, when the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 12, 1, that Christ is the author and the finisher of our faith, uh, we certainly recognize his authorship in the beginning of our faith. I mean, we ask Christ into our hearts and we were born again of the Holy Spirit, which means that the Holy Spirit literally came and dwelt you. As Paul would later say, he turned your, the, your soul into an empty building, into a temple of God, that God becomes resident inside your spiritual dimension of your life. And we began to have this experience of God on the inside and not just seeing him on the outside. I know people say, I like to go into the woods, into nature, and I experience God. And I, I think that's true. I'm not saying that's not true. As I sit on my back deck during the summer, we had bird feeders all over our back deck. <laughs> and... Um, and my wife and I will sit back there and just watch all the dirt birds. And, of course, we watch the uh, the uh, squirrels fight for the seed. And, and we, we see the cats trying to catch the squirrels and the, and the birds. And, and it's quite an interesting play out of nature. But as I look at these birds and I watch the way they fly and they glide and the, the things that they do, even the hummingbirds that come in, you just realize these are th creatures of such amazing complexity 
and, and such incredible capacity, how they can dart and fly and spot start and they can go from zero to 60 in one point second. You know, it's kind of an amazing thing to watch how fantastic these are as just mechanisms. And you begin to realize that we can't make a mechanism that even comes close to that kind of sophistication. If we could create a fighter that could do what a finch can do or what a hummingbird can do, my goodness gracious, we would have the most frightening military capacity in the world. In fact, we might even say it's almost like uh, UFOs, uh, almost a defiance of the laws of nature. But we can study them, can't we? And we realize they're not defying nature, but they are given a unique capacity that we can't duplicate mechanically, even with the highest forms of AI. And so one of the things you begin to realize is that the God of the Creator expresses Himself to anybody who is willing to see Him. And you can look at the macro or the micro universe and everything in between and realize there's got to be a God. I mean, there's just, you can't explain it because there's too much design and there's too much design that requires absolutely infinitesimal uh, intelligence to do. And so therefore, you just, the only reasonable conclusion is to say that there's a God. That's why the psalmist twice in this book of Psalms, David said, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. I mean, you have to blunt, close your eyes, close your ears and deny all of your sensory perceptions to come to the conclusion that there's no God. I mean, that's, that's a willful design. Uh, you have to willfully not want there to be, uh, as one translation put it, you have determined not to know. That's what you have to do. You have to determine that you're not going to know the truth in order to deny that God created all of this. And so basically, he's saying, this is one of those things that the God who created this universe has communicated to us, and it's something that we can stand on, not only at the beginning of our faith, but also at the end of our faith, because God, and this is comforting to me, God wrote the first chapter of my life, and he's going to write the closing chapter of my life. Nobody else is going to do that but God. I'm not going to even do that, and certainly you're not going to do it. God writes the opening chapter. He's the author. He's the beginner, and he's the finisher. He's the one who writes the closing chapter of your life. And everything in the middle is just part of the story, and yet sometimes we get caught up in the middle, don't we? I call it the muddle of the middle. Uh, we get all wrapped up in all of the drama that's going on, and, and I don't say the drama is meaningless. It's not. We suffer a lot of disappointment, a lot of heartbreak. There's some degree of betrayal. Uh, we let each other down on a almost a homicidal level, the way we, we go about life. As I was reading the article uh, just the other day of some hikers who were trying to set some kind of speed record climbing the top of Mount Everest, they passed an injured, injured Sherpa on the side of the road, and instead of stopping and putting off their ascent to save this young man, they decided that they would leave him there and press on. And when they returned from their climb, he had perished. He had died. And you just look at stuff like that and go, what is wrong with us? And I'd like to say, what's wrong with them? But I'd say, no, we have to look at this collectively and realize that the very same self-absorption that would cause them to ignore and allow the loss of another life is the very thing that you and I wrestle with on an ongoing basis. So how do we get free from that? How do we avoid becoming people who are so uh, so uh, carbon-based that we're no spiritually good? How do we become grace-based people? And it begins by knowing that God can be trusted. God is trustworthy. I mean, I, I can count on him that if he says it, that settles it. And I, I can rest on that. So when I'm in the middle with all of the muddle, and I just wonder, God, where are you and what's going on? I can be reminded that he's trustworthy, that he's trustworthy. And if because he died for me, that even if I die with him, I is not death that I'm entering into, it's life that I'm entering into. And because he endured the hardships of the cross and endured the hardship of living with humanity, it would be worse than living with pigs, I think. He endured the hardship of living with humanity he said that if we endure as well, that one day we will reign with him in glory. And he said, you can trust, and this is something you can build your life on. And that really is the thing that separates people who feel like they're succeeding in Christ and those who feel like they're not succeeding in Christ, those who are fruitful and those who feel like they're not. 
Fruitful people are simply people saying, I've decided that I'm going to trust God and, and base my life upon the things that he said and trust him that in the end it will all work out just as he promised it would. So anyway, out of time. Uh, we'll continue tomorrow as we look at the rest of the verse 12. Blessings. Mm-hmm.